but yes, I, I am challenging them to actually do something substantive. Uh, you say you're defending Torah observance, defend it. Hello, and welcome to the beginning of wisdom. I'm Andrew Schumann. In this video, I'm going to be responding to some various topics found in a recent Messiah Matters video uh, from about a month ago. And I thought this was a great video to talk about because of a number of things. It, it had a, a range of topics, but they're, I think, very important. And uh, some of the primary favorite talking points and arguments that come from the Torah observance movements, um, and also some of the favorite arguments against that movement are responded to at least in a, a sort of basic way. And I think it gives us a chance to see what's kind of happening on, on the other side of the debate, so to speak. Um, I will be looking at a, a specific number of things that they're talking about in this video. Uh, they will be talking about uh, an argument. They start off with an argument about the Ten Commandments. And this is an argument against their position based on placing the Ten Commandments in sort of a special status and trying to um, argue from that point of view. Um, and we'll see kind of how they respond to that. And of course, I'll respond to what they're saying and and show kind of what's going on there and why that's maybe not the best uh, argument to, to be concerned with. Um, they do talk a little bit about the law of divorce, um, which I think is a very important one. It what Jesus says about divorce reveals a lot about what he, how he saw the Torah and the commands uh, given to Moses. Um, they talk about whether acts being descriptive has any impact on Torah observance. There are a lot of arguments from the Book of Acts for Torah observance. There are arguments against Torah observance, also from the Book of Acts, but you know the the prescriptive versus descriptive stuff is discussed and i think that's really important they also talk about ephesians 2:15 uh you know does it talk about abolishing the law you know found in ordinances and what does that mean uh, so i thought that was really something we could uh discuss and and i haven't really touched on that verse uh in prior videos so i think it would be useful here and also um they just talk a lot about how they see themselves and the christian landscape and relating to the Torah observance movements and and how people respond to it. And I think that is also very instructive and we can look into that. So we're going to dig into their video. And I guess I will kind of start with my conclusion in a way. And so you know what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing as I, I listen to this this show, is how Torah observance, it it has the ability to sound very reasonable as long as you're speaking in generalities, as long as you're talking, you know, way up high, bird's eye view, not getting down into the nitty gritty details. Once you start doing that, um, you start seeing that specific details just aren't fitting. Uh, it it looks great from from way up high above, but it doesn't look so great down on the ground. Um, now, yes, I as I've said before, I do think of Caleb as a friend. Um, He's a brother in Christ, and so I'm, in this episode that I'm making, I'm not, you know, here going on blast and 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 saying that you know he's a bad person or or that or that they're these are bad people, but I am sh going to show you how the episode, this particular episode of of their show, uh, it presents so many clear examples of how you can think you're arguing from a strong position. But mostly what you're doing is presenting straw man arguments against the other side, uh, addressing only the weakest arguments you can find, and just not really not really dealing with the issue seriously. And so I, I do hope that they will see this and that they will really address some of the important things uh, that we're going to talk about today. So I hope you enjoy it, and let's, let's get into their video. All right. So uh, let's listen to the first clip. This is going to be uh, from about 11 minutes in when they really start, you know, they're done with all their their talky-talky stuff, and they're addressing the first uh, question. So 
Stream Christian Church is getting to a place where they are not able to answer why the Torah would be done away with in a subst- like in a substantial way. The, the 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 go-to answers are have broken down and they've realized that. I think people are realizing that. So they're trying to find that they need like people need a new way to say, oh, the Torah is not an act anymore. And when I say Torah, what I mean is uh, f- festivals, Sabbath, and kosher laws, right? And circumcision. So like, let's figure new way. Let's figure out new ways that God would do away with with these things. And so they've come up with a new one. This is the new argument. And uh, so I'll read the the comment first, and then. Uh... So um, Caleb here is is setting up this this comment that he's about to read, and the comment uh, will we'll get into it a little bit, but it really argues that the Ten Commandments are special. The Ten Commandments are are the real law. And there's other ordinances and things in there, but we don't really have to worry about it. You know, it's really just about the Ten Commandments. And, um, and they go about addressing that. And we'll get to that. But I want to address first what, what Caleb says here. You know, he, he says that, that, you know, that we, the you know, Christians, the, the people who disagree with Torah observance theology, have, you know, we've run out of good arguments. And so we're, we're coming up with stuff. We're shooting in the dark. Um, and he thinks that this comment is a is evidence of that. Well, if if that were the case, then you wouldn't see Rob and Caleb and other folks in the Torah observance movements spending so much of their time answering the most simplistic and least thoughtful challenges to their position. Uh, this particular comment is not very well thought out, and. And so, you know, he's he's acting like this is, you know, the sort of thing that they they haven't, you know, the, it, the other stuff hasn't worked, so now they're, they're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Well, the problem is w- when I look at at especially guys like like Rob and Caleb, they're not they're not answering the actual tough arguments uh, against their position. They're busy answering, you know, stuff like this, you know. I, there, when was the last? I mean, if if you watch their show, and and I mean this sincerely, I know that a lot of people who watch my channel are Torah observant. I know it's it's probably the majority uh, of people, and I find that amazing and 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 odd. If if you watch their show, point me to the episode where they do a deep dive into responding to someone who has really done the work on their position, who is, has spent the time to really understand exactly what they're saying, exactly what their arguments are, and then gone to the scriptures and, and handled it and, and looked at it and tested it according to the scriptures. When have they answered someone like that on something substantial? Uh, the, the fact is there aren't very many doing that. Um, I do that, R.L. Solberg does that, and there are specific cases where you've seen guys like Mike Winger or um, Chris Rosebro or uh, Steve Gregg. You've got, you've got all these guys, and they've done serious study and work. And, and I don't necessarily agree with all the arguments of all those guys. I'm not saying that, oh, they're right about everything. But what I'm saying is they have actually studied what Rob and Caleb believe, actually studied it, actually listened carefully to their arguments, and then actually responded to them. Rob and Caleb, I know that they've responded to R.L. Solberg a couple of times to shorts that he put out. And, you know, YouTube shorts are like, you know, like TikToks or, or other short form videos where you're putting the argument out the best you can in a really short manner. And I don't think it's wrong to respond to those things. I think that if you're if that's all you do and you act like, yeah, we've you know we've we've responded to everything out there and now they're scraping the bottom of the barrel. I just think that's not honest. Uh, you guys haven't done that kind of work. Um, so so do it. Do that kind of work. Um, go go find a a serious. And, and it's not that you even have to. I mean, I know your show's only an hour long. It's not that you have to, you know, take a whole hour-long presentation someone else has done and, and respond to the whole thing, but get the clips that summarize the main argument they're making 
and then go to the text and show why they're wrong and show why you truly understand what they said and why they're wrong and, and see if I, I'd love to see you guys do that. Um, but, you know, what I've seen instead is, uh, you know, responding to shorts, responding to comments. Um, they responded to, you know, the cultish guys when the, the cultish guys went on Ali Beth Stuckey and, and they were just giving their own sort of very, very broad overview, but this isn't their main area of study. You know, they had me on their show four times and you didn't respond to anything I said in any one of those shows. Um, so, you know, and, and I'm, and, and why did they bring me on the show to talk about Hebrew roots? If, if they're experts on it, they could just talk about it, right? Um, they brought me on because they want to talk about Hebrew roots, Torah observance, and, 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 since I use the phrase, let me just make this point real clear. Um, I have never once said that Hebrew roots and Torah observance are the same thing. Not once. I may have used them in succession in a sentence, but usually when you use two different phrases in succession in a sentence, it's because you're differentiating them. Yeah, it's like this and this. These are, these are two different things. So um, I, I say that because I've heard Caleb say that he thinks that he can... Of, he can ignore people if they equate Hebrew roots and Torah observance. But I mean, that's, that's just false too. I mean, he can, he can misrepresent what I believe all day long, but if he makes an argument and it's a good argument, or it's at least a serious argument that needs to be responded to, then, you know, it doesn't matter what he said elsewhere, you know, then I should, I should look at it and, and people, you know, someone who disagrees should look at it and, and answer it. But, you know, they have consistently ignored the most thoughtful arguments that are out there. So uh, the way they set this up, uh, it's, it's just false. It's not true uh, that this is scraping the bottom of the barrel. It's just this is a commenter's thoughts to try to, you know, answer the, the Torah observance argument. That's, that's what they're really arguing against. Now, um, as I said, the, the, I'm not going to play their whole reading of the comment and the, the Ten Commandments argument. I've, I've never found it to be very, uh, very compelling to say that, you know, the Ten Commandments is special and therefore we keep that, but we don't keep the, we don't need to worry about the rest of the law. Um, but, you know, he mentions it, you know, he's playing it like it's a new thing, like, hey, this is the new thing they're trying, as you heard him say. Um, but the fact is, it's not at all new, uh, really. Uh, 119 Ministries did a video many, many, many years ago uh, it's called Book of the Law and Book of the Covenant, and that it, it's it's some different you know terminology, but it's the same argument. It's it's saying that you know hey it's if it's if it's in the Ten Commandments it's it's binding. If it's not, it's not. And and they've they responded to that argument years and years ago. So it's not that uh, that this is something new. It's just what this commenter commented on one of their videos. That's that's what it really is. All right. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, and we're going to talk about a comment that, that Rob has when, you know, and it's in what Rob says, just to set this up a little bit, they're still responding to that argument, you know, and, and this first section of their show, they're saying a lot of things about a lot of things, <laughs> but, and that's fine. It's, it's banter. It's a live show. It's not expected to be this well-studied presentation, but um, they're responding to the idea that you can take the Ten Commandments out. Or, or any part of the law out and say it's, you know, special and different. Um, and, and I think that is a relevant uh, thing to, to discuss. You know, if it, can you do that? You know, does the Bible allow for that? Uh, does the Bible teach that? And, uh, and so he's, they're kind of responding to the whole idea, not just the one argument. So let's listen to what they have to say there. But what we have to recognize is that... If we look at Yeshua, because he says you have to look at Yeshua, right? Well, throughout the Gospels, Yeshua cites the Torah as a unit. The Torah right. is a unit. The, uh okay, so I want to address this comment from, from Rob. He says that Jesus cites the Torah as a unit. Now, we all know, and Rob knows, that that phrase isn't in the Bible. He's not actually citing a text when he says that. He's talking about how Jesus talks about the Torah, it's always, you know, just always as a unit. Now, as a unit, this another way you could say that is 
generally, or you know, the law speaking of the law generally, and not speaking of just you know parts of it, or speaking of different parts of it being different than other parts of it, and that kind of thing. Um, and you know, this is a- another example, and I-, I said this in the last episode that I I made talking about um, Messiah matters, and when they were talking about the term forever. That, that Rob just kind of, it seems like he thinks he's free to just speculate and then treat his speculation as, as established fact. Oh, he, he, he always cites it as a unit. Rob doesn't give us any, exa- any text to support that idea. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not so silly as to demand that where does it say that, you know, in those words or something silly. I, I'm, I'm saying, wait, where does Jesus do that? Or, you know, I mean, certainly he... he a person who just makes a general comment about the law is making a general comment about the law, and we could say as a unit, but that doesn't mean he only does that. And in fact, like the other times when he's when uh, Rob is speculating, um, it's false. It's just plainly false. Um, Jesus doesn't, you know, Jesus on several on on many occasions uh, talks about differences within the law. Off the top of my head, examples, you know, Jesus says you tithe mint and cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, you know, justice and mercy. Jesus, Jesus thinks that some of the some parts of the law are weightier than other parts of the law. That doesn't sound like he's treating the whole thing as a unit. It sounds like he's making distinctions within the law that some things are more important than others. Um, Jesus. In fact, um, one of the most glaring examples is the fact that whenever Jesus is talking about the Sabbath, he often talks about something that overrides or overrules the Sabbath. You know, he he doesn't he doesn't talk about how um, and and this is a common thing. I've said this before. I'll say it again. In speaking about the Sabbath, Jesus never says that the Pharisees are engaged in in man-made tradition. They're not he never says that. He he says that elsewhere. So we know that Jesus thinks in those categories that you know, oh you're you're following man's traditions, you're you're neglecting the law. When it comes to the Sabbath and their challenges against him about the Sabbath, Jesus never once says, "Oh, you're imposing a tradition and I'm I'm just keeping the Sabbath as it as it really says." No, Jesus doesn't do it. What does he actually do? Well, he's, he cites David and the, the consecrated bread in the temple and how David ate the bread. Why does he do that? Well, this happens when they're challenging him and his disciples regarding their eating grain on the Sabbath. They're, they're, they're harvesting, well, they're gleaning grain on the Sabbath. And, and he points out that, well, hey, if, if someone's hungry, are they not allowed to to feed themselves even though it's the sabbath and he points out that you know the the law concerning the consecrated bread in the temple didn't override the fact that david could go ahead and eat that bread even though david's not a priest um and what else does jesus say he says you know your your the priests violate the sabbath and yet are blameless right jesus says they've they it, it, he doesn't say the priests do what is lawful on the Sabbath because what they do is is more important or something like that. No, he says they, you know, violate or or profane, you know, the, depending on your translation. He he's pointing out what they're doing is they're working. They're doing their normal work that they do every day. They do it on the Sabbath, and yet they are innocent, without blame or guiltless, depending, again, on your translation. Why does he say that? Because the temple work was something that over it overruled the Sabbath command. It overrode the Sabbath command. What else did Jesus say? Circumcision. He says, you circumcise on the eighth day, even if it happens on the Sabbath. Why is that? Well, you're trying to keep the Torah, right? But you're finding yourself in a situation where one Torah command and another Torah command conflict, should we circumcise or should we keep the Sabbath? Jesus doesn't say, no, circumcision is okay on the Sabbath. No, he says, no, you go ahead and do this work. Your, your priests who do the circumcisions, guess what? They do those every day of the week, 
and they do them on the Sabbath too. Just like the other work they do in the temple, circumcision they continue to do even on the Sabbath because it's, it's something that's more important. It's, it's a, a higher order law. Uh, circumcision, greater than the Sabbath. The temple, greater than the Sabbath. You know what else is interesting about you know, these, these hierarchies? Jesus says, one who is greater than the temple is here. And that's Jesus. Jesus is greater than the temple, which is greater than the Sabbath. Um, and, and Jesus makes that all the more clear in the account in John when, again, they challenge him and he says, you know, up until now my father is working and, and so I am working. You know, Jesus says, I'm working on the Sabbath. Well, how is that not breaking it? Well, it's not breaking it. It's not breaking it in a way that makes him guilty, just like the priests doing their work is is not breaking it in a way that makes them guilty. He said, you know, he he equates it with God. He says, look, the Father is working always. You know, he we have other texts that talk about the Son and, and how in him all things hold together. Jesus holds the universe together. He does it on the Sabbath too. <laughs> you know, so the works of deity, the works of God that the Father does, Jesus is pointing out, I do those works and I do them up until right now on the Sabbath. So that's how Jesus talks about different laws. He, he absolutely does speak of them in, in distinction to one another and in hierarchies and in ways that make it so that one does not have to be kept if you're keeping a, a, a different one. And you know this, again, equates to things like justice and mercy in a lot of cases. Um, so this, this thing that Rob says, well, Jesus cites the Torah as a unit. Well, that's just, that's not really very meaningful. Um, does he do it ever? Yeah, sure. You know, Jesus will say the law this, the law that, but he, and that's speaking of it in a way that's as a unit. But that's not the same thing as saying what Rob is has to be arguing. Because remember what they're doing. They're responding to someone who says part of the law is more important, the Ten Commandments. They're saying no, that's not true, because Jesus cites it as a, a unit. Well, Jesus cites it also in distinctions and, and differences to one another with, with different laws. So um, Jesus doesn't look at the law the way Rob is saying that he looks at the law. All right, let's uh, look at another example of where they're talking about you know a specific. Remember what I said at the start. We're, when we get into the specifics, that's where things start to just not work uh, for, for the Torah, uh, Torah movements. All right, let me get to that spot. Moses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, but it, but it's true that there are things that are distinction, like with the law of divorce, where Yeshua says it, from the beginning it was not so, but Moses Moses gave you this because of the hardness of your heart. Okay, so what Yeshua is saying there, though, Moses did not add a regulation to teach about Messiah. It was it it has to do with the problem of sin, right and it, it wasn't a the law of divorce is not a delightful development. Uh, it, you know, it's it, and it's it's not. It's, Yeshua says so. There is a, there is a a an ideal that the Torah sets forth. Don't look to the law of divorce as the norm. You can tell when you're listening to Rob here. You can tell this is is one of those parts of what Jesus says that is uncomfortable. It. Because it's it it is definitely rubbing hard against his Torah observance theology. It it is not fitting. And and you heard what he said. You know, he he blazed right past from the beginning it was not so, but and then he starts talking about how this is it's not a delightful thing. Um it's not that, you know, this was something Moses added later. You know, he's 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 trying to find ways to talk about it in, in a very positive way, but um, the problem is he. This is a very big chink in the armor of Torah observance that Jesus says this about the law of divorce because you see the law of divorce is in the Torah. It is part of the law of Moses. It is part of what Moses gives us in the first five books of the Bible, just like every other command in there. The law that says, you know, give a certificate of divorce, it's in there. Their position is that it's all binding, it's all, 
you know, moral, it's all universal, it's, it's God's perfect whole law given to all mankind, you know, we can't, you know, start taking laws out of it. Um, that's, their, that's their theological position. The problem with what Jesus says here actually is in the part that he didn't really want to talk about, and that is, from the beginning, it was not so. And then he, what does Jesus focus on? He focuses on creation, and he says, you know, from the beginning, God made them male and female. Well, that so here you have Jesus. I mean, think about this. Think about if you if your position is that everything in the Torah is something that we need to apply. It, it's all from the beginning. It's all from creation. And Jesus says, actually, this command wasn't from creation. This command came later. Um, and Moses gave it to you because of, of your hard-heartedness. And, you know, Jesus even points it out as being Moses and not God. And, and Jesus does, and we'll talk about it because Caleb's going to talk about that uh, in the next clip. But aside from that, and, and not really making any strong statements about that, uh, did, I'm not saying that, you know, this certificate law wasn't from God. I'm saying that it wasn't from the beginning. It wasn't the original perfect ideal. The perfect ideal was God made them male and female. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, his one wife for life, and no divorce. Divorce is bad, right? This is the, the ideal, and that's what we find in Genesis. But then in, when the law is given, we have you know, some allowances made, and that's what Jesus is saying. From the beginning, it wasn't that way, but because of your hard-heartedness, this was allowed. And um, and I don't think Jesus is even saying that when he says Moses gave it to you, that it wasn't from God. He's just saying that God was was being patient with you. And, and it, the Bible speaks this way. It speaks this way of the pagans and, and that God was patient with, you know, people who, you know, were ignorant and 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 just, he's very patient. And so, uh, so yeah, this was given it. But but that means that that this law, and he's right, it's not something that's a delightful, wonderful law. But if that's the case, and it's in the Torah, then you're you're saying some things that you know you're saying that part of the Torah isn't a delightful thing. Yeah, and and, and Jesus is saying that, and I and you know, Rob Solberg, he he actually um, in one of his videos a long time ago was the one that he, he pointed this out and and I, I realized, yeah, that's that's really powerful. Again, when we look at Rob's answer, we see he's he's again he's making stuff up. You know, he's saying that, oh well there's this ideal the Torah sets forth. And that's what's in Genesis. And that's true, but don't he doesn't seem to see that Jesus is specifically contrasting the ideal found in Genesis with the law found in the Torah. The ideal and the law are not the same thing. And yeah, that's a that's a big problem. That's a very big problem. But he he wants to say if it's in the Torah it's it's this perfect thing, but then he he's finding himself just at odds with what Jesus is saying in this text. It's a But it's let's a, hang on just a, a second. Let, let's pull back for just a second though. I mean, I understand that that uh, when Yeshua says that, he references it, it, Moses gave it to you, right? But ultimately, he, I, I've always seen this as he's talking about the the fact that like the Torah is referred to as Moses, right? Like mm -hmm. you, the shorthand for the Torah is Moses. I mean, I could never think of Yeshua thinking to himself, "Well, Moses gave the Torah, but God didn't." In other words, it's not no, God's exactly. Torah. No, no, that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, another example is the John. So you hear what, what Caleb's saying. He's, he's pointing out, oh, well, just because Jesus says it's Moses doesn't mean that it's lesser or that it's not from God. And, and I would agree. But again, Caleb's, he's, he's skipping over the part that matters, the part that's actually a challenge to his position. It's not that Jesus says, Moses gave you. It's that Jesus says, from the beginning, it wasn't so. That's the part that actually challenges Caleb's position. That's not the part that Caleb's choosing to respond to. You see what I mean? When it comes down to the nitty gritty, Torah observance can't respond to these things. Um, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, the options are, 
you know, retreat back to the general, retreat back to, you know, nice things that the the New Testament says about the law in general, uh, or do what what Caleb does here and and pretend an, an argument is being made that isn't being made. You know, I've never heard anybody, you know, from my side say, "Oh, see, Jesus is saying when he says Moses that it's not really from God." I've never heard anyone make that argument. He's not responding to the main point, the main problem in this text. The main problem is from the beginning it was not so. This commandment in the Torah was not so from the beginning. You heard it, these guys believe it, and many other Torah observance folks believe it, that the Torah is eternal, that the Torah is from the very beginning, this is God's, you know, deposit to man to, to give, you know, his, his Torah. It's, that's just not the case. That is not how the text actually speaks. Um, that is a, it's a pretty picture they want to paint, but it is not actually what you find when you look at the text itself. I did a presentation on uh, the Gospel of John and, and how Yeshua used the word law or nomos throughout the Gospel of John. And Yeshua says, as it says in the law, but then he'll cite like the Psalms or something. He is absolutely right. <laughs> um, and and what I would ask Rob to look at is, is to say, okay, yes, you are correct, sir. Jesus will say, the law says, and this and he's talking about John 10, and when Jesus says, the law says, I said you are gods. And he's citing Psalm 82. Um, that is because, and it's very simple, it's because at the time Jesus spoke those words, the way they referred to what we call today the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures or, or different different terms. Um, Tanakh is a common one among Jews and, and Torah observance folks. Um, even a lot of Christians use it, but it's still a later term. It, it's a, an acronym based on what we do find in the New Testament, which is the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, the Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. That, that threefold expression of the scriptures. What is the scriptures? And that's kind of... Now, Tanakh is a nice, easy, two-syllable acronym. They didn't have that acronym in Jesus' day, but they did have the expression. And it, it, you do find it in the text. Uh, Jesus, um, you know, it, it does appear where they say the law, the prophets, and the and the Psalms is is a common way of saying it because this sometimes you know they'll refer to a, a section with like the first book in that section and the Psalms is the first book of the writings, um, and or sometimes probably the most common uh, way you see it uh, when they're talking about the scriptures uh, using this sort of terminology is the law and the prophets, and then what they'll sometimes do is even shorten that further to just the law, where the law doesn't refer to just the Torah, but it refers to the entirety of the scriptures. And that's why Jesus can say, the law says, and then cite a psalm, because he's talking about all the scriptures, that this is a term that has a broader definition than just, you know, the even the first five books of Moses, obviously it's, it's broader than that, but that is so important, and this is something Rob needs to understand, is that that is so important when you're reading the New Testament, and it makes reference to the law. When the New Testament says namos, what does it actually mean? Is it a reference to the commandments given at Sinai? Or is it a reference to the first five books of Moses? Or is it a reference to the scriptures? And this becomes very, very, very important in one of the most favorite <laughs> passages that Torah observants like to appeal to, and that is Matthew 5, 17. When Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. What did he just say? The law or the prophets. He's using law and prophets together. What does that mean when someone does that? It means they're talking about the scriptures as a whole. They're not talking about commandments. Jesus does go on and, and narrow his focus and starts talking about commandments and says a lot of things that, frankly, I don't think a lot of uh, Torah observance people, you know, 
should be comfortable with in the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to the, the commandments. But definitely when we look at the, um, the fact that he's saying here, the law or prophets, he's saying the whole scriptures. Do not think that I came to destroy the scriptures. That's a lot different than saying, do not think that I came to, you know, make, you know, make no longer binding on you certain commandments or, or the commandments found in the Torah. That's not what even what Jesus is talking about. Um, he's talking about the scriptures. He didn't come to do what? Destroy them, overrule them, dis, you know, overthrow them, but rather to fulfill them. And if you read the book of Matthew where that's found, all the way up to that point, that term fulfill is used many times, and every time it's about prophecy. It's about fulfilling prophecy. So when, you know, I've heard lots of Torah folks say, oh, fulfill means to teach rightly or to do, you know, to, to actually obey, you know, and that's what it's really about. No, it isn't. In Matthew's usage, it means to fulfill prophecy. It means to, that there's the text here and then the fulfillment here. And it's, sometimes it's pretty obvious stuff. That's, that was pretty obviously prof, prophetic when it was written. And then there's the not so obvious stuff. And, and that's a topic for, for its own uh, video. But my point is, throughout Matthew, especially up to this point, no one's given us any, he has never given us any reason to think of any other definition of fulfill other than related to prophecy. Well, if Jesus is talking about the scriptures as a whole and not just the commandments found in the Torah, and it's an, and another thing, you know, that that term destroy I've been using in in this uh, right now um, is a, is probably one of the more common modern translations. You know, the King James says abolish, but it it's really, you know, it, it really means to overthrow or destroy. Um, that term is is never used. You know, it it, it isn't. It's not about commandments no longer being binding. You know, in the next verse when he says, not a jot or tittle will pass away from the law. Pass away is a phrase that is never used in regards to laws no longer becoming binding. It, it means for something to pass out of existence. Jesus is saying the scriptures themselves, not, they will not pass out of existence. They will continue to exist and be knowable and readable, you know, till the heavens and earth pass away. That's what he's actually talking about in Matthew 5. And I can know that. The, the way that I know that is because I know that what Rob is talking about, that the term namas gets used in a number of ways, and from the context we can tell what it is actually talking about. Um, Rob's uh, comments here, if, if, he, if he thought them through all the way and in light of what the scriptures actually say, uh, they wouldn't actually be of any, any real help to his theology. All right, let's go to the next. It's, uh, it sounds like there's an agenda there. Like, yeah, the agenda is to get rid of the Torah. Don't you dare tell me to keep the feasts. Right, yeah. And then to, and then to flip that on, you misunderstand. If you're me, keeping the feasts, let, you're let the one who misunderstands. Let me, let me shove my theology into the Bible to make it say yeah, okay, what I want. Yeah, okay, I'm done. Thank you for letting here's, me... Uh, here's my, here's, here's my, my... So everything that you said, yes, 100%. Okay. So an agenda, you know, and this is something again that, that these guys and, and not just these guys, but you know, pretty much it's, it's across the board in the Torah movements. Um, it is, it is so common to see this kind of, um, really false witness against your neighbor. That's what this is. Uh, the other term for it is slander. Uh, the term slander, it, it has a specific meaning. It means, to, to accuse someone falsely of wrongdoing. They're accusing, you know, and, and again, they're still talking about the comment about the Ten Commandments and using that, you know, distinction to somehow, you know, not have to keep other, other laws. And, and there, you know, Rob's conclusion is, well, there's an agenda there. Um, and he's, he's going after someone's motive and, and you know what? Yeah, there's an agenda. I have an agenda. My agenda is, what does the Bible say? Can we please do that? Can we please look at the whole Bible together and understand it as it presents itself and not put these 
artificial systems on top of it. Oh, I'm going to take my theology and cram it into the Bible. Exactly. Let's not take Torah observance theology, which is not the same thing as the Torah, and cram it into the Bible. Torah observance theology, and this is modern Torah observance theology, is not the same thing as what God commanded Moses and what God commanded the people of Israel through Moses. Where was the nation of Israel, you know, all up, you know, through the Old Testament, were they commanded to be Torah observant? You bet they were. <laughs> that was the covenant. That was what that was their situation that that they were in, that God placed them in, that they agreed to. It's a hundred percent um accurate to say that they had a a version of Torah observance theology. The Torah observance theology of today in seeking to incorporate in you know that with the New Testament and Christ and all that, it it's false. It's a false theology being crammed into the Bible. And we see it. We've we've already seen examples of it. You can't you can't really take Jesus for exactly what he says about divorce. You can't really take Jesus for exactly what he says about things like the Sabbath and weightier matters of the law. No, those are let's just say Jesus says it all, you know, that he treats the Torah as a unit. You know, let's just say that Jesus didn't make distinctions in the law, even though he clearly did. Um, you see that there's this conflict between Torah observance theology and the Bible. And that's what I'm trying to bring out and, and, and make so clear. But when, when and this is the, the actual case, when your position is not biblical, when it, when it is false, um, you can't argue for it. In, in a completely full, fully honest way. You have to do things like what Robin Caleb did in this clip. You have to start going after the motives of your opponents. You'll notice I'm not, I haven't talked about the motives other than things I know. I know Rob and Caleb believe in Torah observance. I know that they're trying to argue for that. And I'm not faulting them that they're trying to argue for their position. The fault they have is that the arguments are bad. They're not based on scripture. They're based on making things up. They're based on, on in this case, um, making false accusations against their opponents. Um, those that disagree with them have an agenda that's you know that's dishonest and and that they just want to do away with the law. No, that's not the case at all. Their opponents want. Now maybe that's the case with some. I don't know. I don't know everybody's motives, but I can tell you that what, what I'm arguing is let's look at the scriptures. Let's actually look at what they all say and, and understand them in their own context and see where we get. Um, and, and that's not what they're doing. You know, they're, they have, uh, the fact is, even if it turns out that they're right in a given case about somebody's motives. There's somebody that just, you know what, they just don't want to be Torah observant. They just don't like some of those laws. And so they make a they make an argument against it. And that person doesn't is not that they really care about what the Bible says. It's not really that they um they're just trying to be honest. No, they they really are just selfish and and that's what the person that's what's really behind the argument. Even if they're right in any particular case about any particular person, that hasn't actually addressed the argument that was made. Because see, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. You know, that's this is the this is why ad hominem is a fallacy. Because if you attack the person, you have avoided dealing with the argument. And so if that person made if that person made a bad argument, you should be able to deal with the argument. If that person made a good argument, then you should change your mind because that person made a good argument. I don't care what their motive was. Um, and if someone has a bad motive, they'll answer to God for their bad motive, but that doesn't automatically make everything they say false. Um, the two things just aren't related. So every time, and, and you hear this so much, as, and, and these guys, I've heard it many, many times. Oh, you know, people, and we'll hear it again, I think. Um, you know, they've just been taught to believe a certain thing, and that's why they do this. No, 
That's not all, maybe, sometimes. But even if you're right, you haven't addressed the argument. You're avoiding the argument. Anytime you you jump into that, you know, that puddle and say, it's your motives or it's your upbringing, you're avoiding the, the actual case. So come on back. Let's look, let's talk about the actual case. Um, all right, let's move on to the next uh, bit here. Well, and, and you have the problem away of like, with, you know, the Acts 21 problem. Like, well, why are they doing Nazarite vows? This is James. Like, this is the author of the epistle of James. This is Yeshua's brother. Um, why does Paul write uh, that he wants to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost? You'd have to say, or why did Paul circumcise Timothy in Acts 16? You would have to say either A, they were misinformed. Right. Like Paul didn't get it. James, it's like they're so, because they are they were so steeped in the Jewish world of these ordinances that the first generation of believers were kind of like a transitional generation. Like they, because they didn't fully understand how bright and, and transformative the revelation of the Messiah was, um, right. that they were still... And grasping keep in mind, at shadows. Keep, keep in so mind, by the way, Paul keep in circumcised mi- Timothy. Paul made it a priority to be in Jerusalem at Pentecost. Oh, really? Because he just wanted to, he knew that that would be an opportunity to preach and there'd be a lot of Jews there. Keep Not, in mind, it didn't have anything to do with the the holiday itself. Keep, You'd have keep to in, come up with some kind of thing like that. Keep in mind that, that Paul, at the time that he, that uh, Acts 21 has happened, you already have Galatians written, Romans written. You already have... Uh, uh, I mean, come on, Galatians and Romans alone, that's where everybody's trying to get their, their uh, you know, uh, they're, they're trying to get their, uh, their ammunition against the Torah from these books. Paul has already written these books, and now he's going to Jerusalem and he's sacrificing? And here's the... So you see Rob talking about several different uh, events in Acts, and that these are favorite events to bring up when it comes to talking about the Torah. Uh, really, no matter what the question is, no matter what the issue is, let's talk about these several passages in Acts. Um, they apply to every single argument <laughs> against uh, Torah observance, it seems. Um, but I, I want to address a couple of things that, that Rob points out. Um, Rob seems to think that there are basically a couple of options. And, and it's it's a little disorganized there, but I think this is what he's saying. You know, the... the, uh, the reason why um, he, he's trying to say, well, if people are arguing against their position, then that leaves cer- certain options as far as what's going on with the apostles and, and really in Acts. Either A, they were misinformed, that they just didn't understand that things had changed, and so they're still doing things the way they always did them. Uh, or B, um, they're just it's just being used as an opportunity to preach, that they, they want to do these things because that'll give them, you know, the ability to to be uh, preaching, you know, to to Jews, and and so they they continue to do these things, even though they really don't believe them. And uh, and then you hear what Caleb says about, um, you know, they're trying to get their ammunition against the Torah from like Galatians and Ro- Romans, um, and uh, and he's written, you know, he asks how it is that Paul has written these books, and then he's just going to Jerusalem and, and sacrificing. Um, so I want to look actually at some of these these texts. Uh, of course, Rob's cup two options are are not the only options. <laughs> uh, I hope that's not too big of a surprise. It's not just either or of these two things. It's not either they that the apostles who are leading the church are just misinformed about the law, or that they are just using the law as a way to witness, but they just they they think it's all hooey now, you know, and, and, and it just doesn't say that. Um, that's not really the only two options. Um, it, they never acknowledge, and, and this is something, again, you see a lot in the Torah movements, they never acknowledge the idea that something in the Torah could change from being required to being merely acceptable but not required. Um, that's not something that that they ever acknowledge as a possibility. It's almost always, when you hear them talk about it, it's almost always, you must do it, has to be changed to you must not do it. And then they're like, look, the text doesn't say you must not do it, therefore we're right. No, that's 
another fallacy. It's false dichotomy. It's it's not that there are only two options. Um, the things that in the Torah that that change, and that is a word that the Bible says <laughs> that you know Hebrews seven does say the a change in the law. So the things that change in the law change in the law, but that doesn't mean that they have to change from being something you must do to something that's forbidden. Those aren't the only two options, but they never really acknowledge that. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, some of these things that uh, that he mentioned, he mentioned Paul wanting to go to Pentecost, um, Paul circumcising Timothy. Why did Paul pay the fees for the Nazarite vow uh, of those other men? Um, there are lots of responses out there to these these questions. Why did these things happen? It's not only either Torah observance or or there just couldn't be any possible logical reason. There are lots of reasons. Um, you know, the the one about, uh, for example, I mean, the opportunity to preach, that's a, a plenty good reason for Paul want to want to get to Pentecost. Um, there's pretty good reason to think that Paul didn't get to all of the festivals during the time when he was in, in Ephesus. Um, we just, I mean, we don't have a record of it, and it seems like a big deal when he finally left uh, to go and go back to Jerusalem. That's... You know, that's a big deal. And yeah, there are a couple of different ways you could look at that and argue that. But my point is, there are lots of good reasons for that. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be, oh, I must keep, you know, why is he saying, oh, I got to get back? And he's not telling everyone else to come with him. Why, why, aren't, why isn't everyone coming, being commanded to come with Paul as he goes back to Jerusalem for the, the Feast of Pentecost? Because they don't have to. That's why. It's not something that everyone just absolutely must do, and and why aren't you all getting up and, and coming with me? You know, Paul doesn't say that. He just says he desires to go. Great. You know, again, that, that has zero, that poses zero challenge to the traditional Christian view of the law. Zero. None whatsoever. It, it, there's nothing in that that presents any problems for anyone who doesn't agree with Torah observance theology. Um, what about uh, Paul circumcising Timothy? What about that one? Well, that happens in, in uh, uh, Acts 16, as he mentioned. Um, that happens right after the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. That council gets called in response to the controversy concerning circumcision. Why is it that uh, you know the the Jews or, or the the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised? And so here you have. The, the council happens, a letter is written to the Gentiles, and it does not, and it says, hey, we want to do, don't, don't worry about anything, you know, as far as what you're doing, don't worry about anything except these things. These are, the, these are important things, and it's not circumcision. Circumcision didn't make the list. And there's a whole thing on, on Acts 15, I'm not going to dive into everything about Acts 15, but I want to make it clear, the letter didn't mention circumcision. The controversy surrounded it. The letter didn't mention it at all because it, it was not the thing that they, had, they needed to do or needed to be concerned with. The thing they needed to be concerned with were things that would create problems and division within the church between Jews and Gentiles. That's what, what those things all represented. And here you have Acts 16, and Paul circumcises Timothy. But what does it say? He does. Uh, it says he does it because of the Jews. Paul doesn't circumcise Timothy because of obedience. Paul doesn't circumcise Timothy because he's a member of the covenant, and covenant people must be circumcised. No. He circumcises Timothy because of the Jews. Because, you see, Timothy was going to be going with Paul on his journeys and going to places like Jerusalem and the temple and the synagogues and all these Jewish places that Paul was going in in, in addition to others but but that's you know something that Paul was doing and because of them that's why Sir Timothy circumcised it's the text itself says why Robin Caleb you know Rob in this case is asking why did this happen as if the only answer is because of the Torah, but that's not the answer. That is not, the text tells us the answer, and it's not that. It's because of the people, 
and the people being, you know, there being a rift with those people because Timothy is going to these places uncircumcised. So Paul circumcises Timothy. And of course, you know, in Galatians, we see Titus, who's a full-blooded Gentile, no, no Jewishness to him at all. Um, Paul says clearly, and without qualification or later amendation, we did not, you know, give in to their demands for an hour that Titus should be circumcised. He was not circumcised. Period. That's all Paul says. Paul never makes any reference to Titus or anyone else getting circumcised later or doing it in, in any sort. This is all stuff that has to be added if you're Torah observant. You gotta, you gotta add, you know, fill in the gaps with with a lot of this detail that's just not in the text. And and the details that are in the text, like because of the Jews, that gets ignored. That just gets, you know, brushed under. Yeah, we don't want to. <laughs> it tells us why we don't want to talk about why we we want to talk about it as if it's something that Paul was doing because of the Torah. And then what about the Nazarite vow in in uh, in Acts twenty one? Well, there are a couple of of interesting things going on there. Number one is I would I would point out Paul wasn't sacrificing. Paul didn't sacrifice anything. Um, if if you look at the text itself. Um, it is very clear. Acts 21, 25. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided that they should keep from meat sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from sexual immorality. There you have the, the four instructions found in the, in the letter. And then it says in verse 26, then Paul took the men, that is the ones with the Nazarite vow, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Paul didn't offer a sacrifice. He just declared to them, hey, they've, they've done their vow. This is when you know, the, the days of purification are up, and, uh, you know, and then it says until a sacrifice can be offered. Paul didn't offer a sacrifice. So that's, that's a common... Mis, uh, misunderstanding in this in this passage, one that I've had before. I, I thought that oh yeah, he's doing this, but he wasn't. He didn't offer anything. So that's a small detail, but kind of important. Um, another point I would make, and this is one that that is often brought up when this text is brought up. And again, here we are. We're talking about the actual text. I'm not just throwing something out there and saying what about this, you know, like like what what Rob was doing. It says, uh, and starting in verse 18, it says, And the following day Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God did among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear you that you have come. Therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself among them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Then all will know that there is nothing to the things which have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. So here's, here's what happens, right? James is saying, you know, do these things just so people can see you, that you're not, you know, that you're, you're keeping, you're walking orderly, keeping the law. But notice, notice the actual accusation. The accusation is the accusation. Let's, let's consider this. What is the actual thing that Christians have said concerning the law? Uh, and, and yes, I, I admit, you know, there are many things, <laughs> many different positions that Christians have had concerning the law. But what what many Christians today will say, and and what I think many Christians have said in the past, is that you know, doing these things in the law, like like the Sabbath and circumcision and such aren't wrong. They're not evil or wicked things. They're just not things that God 
has, you know, obligated us to do under the new covenant. Um, have some said, oh yeah, you, they're, if you do them now, it's wicked. Yes, some have said that. I'm not saying that. And a lot of people today are not saying that. Um, and I think that we should look at statements like that in, in their own context and ask, you know, why are they saying that? In what context are they saying that it's wicked? Because I, I think that anything that is not commanded but is allowed can still be done in a, a way that that is wicked. Um, you can love your you can love your parents in a way that's wicked. You can love your children in a way that's wicked. If you put them before Christ, you're doing it in a way that's wicked. So there are thing there are ways of doing good things that are that <laughs> that are wicked. So um, again, I would I would say let's look at the context of that. But coming back to this is. Is Paul, what is Paul actually being accused of? Is he being accused of telling people they don't have to keep the Sabbath? Or telling people they don't have to circumcise their their children? What what is actually being said? Let's, Let's look at that verse again. They have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. This is what Paul is being accused of here is commanding people to stop doing Torah stuff. Stop it. Don't do that anymore. That is what Paul is being accused of. Paul is not being accused of telling people, hey, that is a picture that has led us to Christ. It is no longer required under the new covenant. That's not what Paul's being accused of. And you know what's, what I find so interesting here is that what James is talking about is exactly the same kind of, of accusation that the Torah people make, that Torah observance people make against Christians, that we're teaching people not to do or that we're telling people it's wrong to do these things found in the Torah. That's what that's what we're accused of. It's again, it's never acknowledged that it might be something that's just no longer required. It's it it's always characterized as if we're saying the command is now a positive command in the opposite direction. What used to be required is now forbidden. And if you read what what James said, that is exactly what he says. Paul is being accused of making that which was commanded forbidden. Don't do those things. I think this is one of the examples of of what uh, you know when when Peter says that you know certain people twist Paul that this is an example of that. Because what sort of teaching do you think Paul could have actually tell, told people? that could be twisted into this. What kind of teaching might he have, have said that would make people say that he's for teaching people to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise? Well, maybe if he told if he was teaching people, hey, we're under a new covenant, here are the here are the commands of this covenant, the signs of this covenant, here's how those commands that are not part of this covenant relate to this covenant. What if he was and and you know it's not God isn't forbidding you, but those things are no longer required. If, if, if Paul said something is no longer required, could someone who's really zealous for the law twist that into Paul is telling people not to do it? Sure they could. They still do it today. That's what Paul's being accused of in, in Acts 21. He's not being accused of the standard Christian position on the law. He's being accused of something more extreme than the standard Christian view of the law. Just like standard Christians today are, are accused of more extreme things than what we actually believe. Um, it's, it's rather interesting that uh, we find that, um, that correlation there. All right. So I just want to, again, uh, reemphasize that I strongly object to this misrepresentation of Christians. Um, anytime I make an argument for the proper Christian relationship to the law 
and it's characterized as being against the Torah, that's, that's a lie. That's a slander. I'm not against the Torah. I think the entire Torah is scripture. It is God-breathed scripture. It is for us. It is profitable for us today. All of it, every single commandment in the Torah is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and cor correction, for, for training in righteousness today. The way that it's profitable for that is by seeing it in its proper context, in its proper covenant, in, in all of those things that taking the whole Bible together. That is not being against the Torah. That's being against your particular, rather recent Torah observance position. That's, that's what it's against. Uh, it's not against the Torah. And the fact is, I mean, Caleb, for example, he doesn't like it. If you, if you characterize him as, as Hebrew roots or legalistic or any of these other terms that, that he believes have these negative connotations, he wants you to define these things and, and, and say these things as he believes them. He, he doesn't want you to say he's a, he's a Hebrew rooter. <laughs> you know? He wants you to say that, that he is Torah observant. He's a Torah observant Christian, evangelical Christian who believes in the Torah. That he wants you to characterize him the way he wants you to characterize him. And all I'm saying is, me too. Yeah, I want that too. But Rob and Caleb don't seem to, <laughs> to think that it's a problem to, to characterize people like me in the, in the most unflattering, least defensible, straw man light that, that they want to. They think it's totally okay. And if, if this sounds like I am calling them out for a moral failing, you're darn right I am. Yes, I am calling them out for being hypocrites right now in this area on this particular topic. Does that mean I think they're not Christians? No. I believe they are brothers. Does that mean that I, I don't like Caleb or that I don't want to be his friend? No, it doesn't mean that. It means, guys, you're, you're being hypocritical is what you're doing. You're willing, to, you're willing to say things as in the most unflattering light as you can think of when it comes to people who disagree with your theology. And meanwhile, if someone uses a label, uh, not even about you, but in a way that you kind of perceive might be about you, you think that it's an excuse to not even listen to that person. In fact, I know this is true, 100%. And I will go ahead and play a clip that's, that shows this, where Caleb says, yeah, if someone if someone equates Torah observance and Hebrew roots, I just don't even listen to them. Solberg. Now, if you don't know who R.L. Solberg is, he is a scholar who has essentially made his um, he's he's made his uh, ministry. Uh, I, I want to be careful how I uh, how I f phrase this. He's made his ministry uh, in attempting to respond to what he calls the Hebrew roots movement. Now, he has labeled this Torahism. I have avoided talking about Solberg, and the reason why is uh, several fold, but uh, perhaps the most <laughs> glaring reason is because Solberg straight out says he's talking to the Hebrew Roots Movement. I am not part of the Hebrew Roots Movement. And so we have always, Torah Resource was formed in 2002, we have always taken a stand against the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now, what Solberg has done is he has equated, and this is what a lot of people do, and this is so frustrating. In fact, Schumacher, Andrew Schumacher, who we talk about uh, every once in a while on the show, and who listens to this show, and who is, I would consider him, if not a really good acquaintance, I would consider him a friend. Um, I really like Andrew, he's a great guy, but... He has also made a ministry out of responding to what he calls the Hebrew Roots Movement. Now, he lumps us in with the Hebrew Roots Movement. I'm sorry, but that's, that's not just. That's not righteous behavior. Um, that's saying, you know, that, you know, that you can ignore the truths, the, the, the challenges that you're receiving based on, on what criteria. What, what Bible do you have to back that up? that kind of behavior up. You don't have any. Um, it's just wrong. It's just wrong and you should stop doing it. I, I frankly, yeah, I don't like it if you you characterize me as saying I want to do away with the law or, you know, any of these other things that, that you say or having an agenda <laughs> or any of that stuff. Yeah, I don't like that. I think it's wrong. It doesn't mean that I'm going to totally just ignore your arguments. I'm here 
addressing them. I'm here talking about them in detail. Um, I'm still going to address them, even if I don't like the way that I'm being characterized. Um, you should do the same. And you should stop. If, if you care so much, you know, how people characterize you, you should be careful how you characterize them. Uh, I'll leave that as it is. Let's, uh, let's move to the next, uh, next clip here. This is what he says. Jude says, there's nothing against Gentiles observing Shabbat. However, teaching mandatory Shabbat observance for all people is incorrect. Let's pause real quick. What do we mean by mandatory? You're going to need to clarify that. Would you say that it's mandatory, according to the Torah, not to commit adultery? Is it mandatory not to lie? Is it mandatory? I mean, it... The Shabbat is just another covenant regulation. Caleb, you know, he's talking here about things being mandatory and, and not really, as, as we'll see um, when he goes further into this comment, we'll, we'll keep listening to it from this point. Um, he doesn't like it that, oh, mandatory. Is it mandatory to not commit adultery? Yes, the answer is yes, it is mandatory. It's mandatory to do that. <laughs> to do that. Um, the issue, again... But I want I want to talk about this uh, this phrase. This they're all it's all just covenant re regulations. But you know what Caleb is not addressing when he says this, and I I did um, call into their their um, comment line, their phone line, their question line that they have, and up till this recording they haven't answered this. You know that was a couple weeks ago. So hey, you know maybe they'll get to it at some point. But I asked this question based on this covenant regulation thing. If, a, if something's a covenant regulation, then it's part of a covenant, right? It's for people in that covenant. If adultery is just a covenant regulation or, you know, the prohibition against adultery, then were people outside the covenant not expected to not commit adultery? I mean, were they expected? Were they – it was just acceptable for – adultery is just acceptable among those outside the covenant? That doesn't seem right, does it? Seems like God God created those people, and those people shouldn't commit adultery, <laughs> right? Um, this is something that that I've I've talked about many many times that I've never heard an answer about from Torah observance folks, and that is when it comes to to um, the people, the other nations around Israel at the time that. You know, everyone agrees that all Christians agree that everything that was found in the Torah was binding on the people of Israel. Was it binding on everybody? You know, I've made that case many, many times that there are lots of laws that simply couldn't be because the purpose of those laws was to set Israel apart as special and different, not as the, as the nation in covenant with God. That's why those commandments exist. But... Therefore, they don't apply to everyone outside. But then there are some things, like what he mentions, like adultery, that do apply. That do apply to every single pagan nation out there at the time, uh, you know, that ancient Israel was was on the earth. So, you know, and again, this is another example of Caleb kind of. Well, I'll, I'll get to that with the next part. But I want—I just wanted to focus here on the on the covenant regulation thing. If if a commandment has to do with the covenant, then it's not for everybody, is it? It's for people in that covenant. And then that means that today, when, now that we are, have the new covenant, how does that affect everything related to the Sinai covenant? What is the what is the what are the implications of the new covenant? And we can't just assume that the Sinai covenant regulations carry through into the new covenant anymore can we because they're not the same covenant but uh let's let's move on and uh and see what the next thing is he says and once again if we go back to the comment that uh who was it that thomas made in the uh in the chat room these are not burdens it's not a it's not like i have to look at this and be oh man i'm mandatory that i have to not cheat on my wife no, it's a blessing. God gives us a reflection of himself. These are blessings uh, that are, are given to us. The way that we know God loves us is because he has given us his word and his Torah and, and his laws. These are blessings. So I, 
I understand what what Jude is saying here, but I, I have a problem with the notion of saying that the uh, that the laws of God are quote unquote mandatory. There's uh, my dad wrote an article on Torah Resource called "Is the is I obligation just it. obligation yeah is, yeah is obligation the uh, the the right word." So you'll notice you'll notice how he's he's when he's talking about obligation. He's coming at it from the question of burden versus blessing. And, and he says, this is a problem with Jude's comment. But Jude didn't meant this Jude person that, that made the comment. He was just asking whether something was mandatory. He, he wasn't asking whether it was a burden. Caleb, again, is he's shifting the focus away from the actual question, the actual issue, to a, a, a separate issue. You know, oh, he'd rather talk about whether it's a burden or a blessing than whether it's mandatory. And again, yeah, it, the prohibition against adultery is mandatory. That's absolutely right. And that is the right word. Uh, mandatory means required, obligatory. You have to do it. You're, you, you know, it's wrong for you not to do it. That's, that's all that means. It, it doesn't say anything about whether it's a burden or a blessing. It, it just doesn't. And I agree that the... The commandments of God that that any person is obligated to keep are blessings. Any anything that I'm obligated to to keep, God has given it, and it is a blessing. I don't see it as a burden. I don't think that God's commands are burdensome. I also don't think that circumcision is mandatory, and it's not because it's a burden. It's because it's just now. It's not that it's not a burden either. You know, he's talking about, oh, it's such a burden to to not cheat on my wife. You know what? For some men, it is. For some men and women, it's it's a burden. They feel burdened by the fact that they can't just sleep around. They just that's what they really want to do. And to them, it feels like a burden to do what God commanded. Doesn't mean they're right, but again, that's the that's the the category in which. Caleb's comments are operating in. It's operating on in whether it's a good thing or bad thing, you know, for me, and whether I feel that way or not. And and it, I know it, he's not basing it all on that. It's a it's a blessing, you know. God's commands are a blessing regardless how you feel about them. But but that's not even the question. That my point is he's shifting it away from the actual question. The actual question is: Is it mandatory? Is it required? Leave the burden thing off the table. Is it required? And, and it sounds like, I haven't read the article that he's talking about that his father wrote. It sounds like his father's kind of following the same path. He'd, he'd rather just not talk about whether mandatory is a good, you know, it, whether it's mandatory. Because he just wants to talk about that it's such a blessing. And, you know, I agree. I mean, there's, there's a lot of wisdom in, in the Torah commands. You know, there, there's a lot of wisdom all over the scriptures. And there's things that, that maybe aren't a command, but... We have, you know, some examples, and and if we follow in one direction, it's it's better for us, you know. But that's again not the question. The question is, is it mandatory? And that's that's the question that Caleb's answer avoids answering. All right, let's move on to the next clip here. Passage Ephesians two eleven. Now, once again, you know. Th- I think that Paul is very much in a mindset here. He's in this mindset when he's in Galatians. He's in this mindset even at the end, towards the end of Romans. He's in this mindset in Colossians. He's in this mindset in Ephesians. And that mindset is is this same old thing that we continue to go back to. And I, I, every single week I, I bring this up. The idea is that the, that the Jews are saying in the first century, as they say today, it's the exact same thing. Nothing's changed. They're saying in the first century, if you want to be in covenant with God, you have to convert. And what is the culmination of conversion? It's circumcision. I always find this interesting how, and it's, it just seems universal <laughs> among uh, Torah observant folks. Um, whenever they discuss Paul, it's like they have to do this big, long like introduction about it before we can talk about it you know we got to talk about how Paul's in this certain mindset and it's about you know and in his, in this case the the argument he's making is that you know it's it's about circumcision being this 
con, you know, Jewish conversion thing, and it's not really the circumcision from the Bible, and and that's a whole argument, and 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 someday I'll I'll get into that. But I just think it's interesting. They just can't do it. They can't just get into talking about Paul by reading the text. We have to talk about Paul's mindset. We have to talk about Paul's background. We have to talk about everything about Paul that we can to try to really, what is all that doing? Well, all of that is um, trying to give us his particular framework for reading the, these passages in Paul that just don't fit with his theology. Um, and if, if, we, if we see Paul in this very narrow framework, this very narrow mindset, as he puts it, you know, maybe we can deflect a lot of that stuff. And, and uh, I just find it so interesting. I mean, look up, you know, if, if you know, I mean, I know, again, I know most of my viewers uh, are some kind of Torah observant, I, I believe. Um, at least all my comments and, and things like that seem to indicate it. Find your favorite teacher. Find several teachers you like in the, in the move, you know, any Torah observant, you know, folks and, and go and find, you know, if they, if they make YouTube videos or if they write articles, whatever, find what they've produced on Galatians and see how long it takes them <laughs> to finally talk about Galatians <laughs> and actually start going through the text. It's, it's amazing how often and how it is almost universal that they just have to do this. They have to, oh, we got to talk about this mindset or we got to talk about this. This this is really what Paul was dealing with, you know, and that's the, the that is sort of the, the thing that we're going to put on the text in order, it's a filter we're going to put on the text so that we can see the text the way that we're supposed to see the text um, rather than just letting it speak for itself. Um, I just think that's, that's amazing. And, um, you know, the the fact is, and, and and I do want to address the the actual thing that that Caleb says here. You know, he says it's about this this ritual circumcision, this ritual conversion thing that the Jews were supposedly doing back then. That that was not the same as circumcision. You know, as commanded to, to Abraham, it's something we have to distinguish from that. You know, bec- and and the answer is clear why because everything Paul says that is so negative about circumcision, well, his theology doesn't fit those things Paul says about circumcision. So he needs needs some kind of filter to put over that text to say, actually, what Paul's talking about is ritual conversion to Judaism, which included circumcision and talked about circumcision a lot, but it wasn't really just the the circumcision in the Bible. We got to make this distinction. The problem is there's no text in which Paul makes that distinction. Certainly, Paul talks about the party of the circumcision. And there's lots of texts where you can go to talk about how there's these people who are demanding circumcision, but none of them makes none of them makes the case that Caleb's making. And this is a big problem. If you're if your case that you're making that you think the Bible is making, but there isn't a text that actually makes that case then you can't say the Bible's making that case. Um, it, you're, you're inferring some things, and that inference better be pretty solid. But the problem is it's just not. There's no, again, Paul never clearly distinguishes between regular physical circumcision as found in the law of Moses. He never distinguishes that from this special proselyte, Jewish proselyte ceremony. He just doesn't do it. And I didn't include it in that clip just because I have a lot of clips. <laughs> but um, Caleb goes on to cite Galatians and, and where Paul says that Abraham is justified by faith before being circumcised. And that's very true. But when he's citing that text, you see that he's equivocating. He's, he's not being consistent about which type of circumcision he's talking about. Because clearly, when Paul is talking about being justified by faith before being circumcised, and he's talking about Abraham, he's not talking about the, these Jewish circum, circumcision party people who are doing this special cer- ceremony. He's not talking about them. Clearly, Paul is not talking about them in the text where he talks about we're justified by faith without circumcision 
when he's talking about Abraham, because clearly Abraham's circumcision wasn't that. It was the biblical kind, right? Um, and so, you know, there are, we can find places, my point is we can find places where Paul is clearly talking about the biblical kind of circumcision and using that circumcision to make his argument in Galatians. We can't find a place where Paul is clearly, without question, talking about this special proselyte thing, this special conversion ceremony to Judaism. Where is it? Where Where is the text that clearly and unambiguously is referring to that and making a contrast between that and true circumcision? And this is another question that 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 uh, I've never heard them answer. Is you know if if uh, if it's all about this other kind of thing and not real circumcision, and that's how Paul can say all this stuff. Where's the place where Paul or you know, where Paul says, but you know, down the road, at some point, you're to be obedient to the Torah. You you need to be circumcised. Again, it's it's not to be found. It's not to be found anywhere because Paul is not making the distinction that Tim Hag and Caleb Hag and 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 these guys are are making. Uh, it just again, it's not in the text. It's it's something being imposed on the text. All right, and in this next section, now um, we kind of missed. What uh, what was the point? In all of that, Caleb was introducing what? He was introducing Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2.15 is the one that has that phrase about abolishing the law found in ordinances. Um, and now he's come, you know, I'm skipping ahead, you know, because there's just, we're not going to play the whole show. Um, but, but there's a, a section here I wanted to respond to where we're coming back to this law this commandments and ordinances stuff, and and this this is the common argument you'll hear. Um, Caleb says it. I've I've seen one nineteen ministries uh, makes this argument uh, in their book, uh, their Pauline paradox book, and I'm sure in their Pauline paradox videos as well. Um, I did write a whole s- series of articles on beginningwisdom.org against you know responding to the Pauline paradox book. So if you didn't know about that, go check that out. Um, but that. Uh, uh, but it's this very same argument. It's about the this term dogma, the, this Greek term. So I want I want to go ahead and let you hear this argument, and then we'll we'll kind of address it. In verse fifteen, by abolishing the law of commandments, now they're going to say the mainstream Christian church is going to say, "Aha! See the law of commandments." He's talking about the Torah, <clears throat> but you have to see the Greek here. By abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances, this word ordinances is dogma. Dogma is never used of the commandments of God. Dogma is always used of man-made tradition. And you can see this even in the apostolic, the New Testament text. Look up the word dogma. It is used, I think, six times throughout the apostolic scriptures. Now, the only time that you'd be able to say that, that it's talking about the law of God is if you say that Paul uses it for the law. Because Paul uses it, I think, three times. The other times, it's all... But clearly, he's not talking about that. He can't be talking... So you notice there the argument. You know, Caleb is making the argument that because it's the word dogma, we're looking at the Greek. That's the important thing. That is only about the commandments of men. But you'll notice at the end of that clip that he starts to walk that back a little bit, right? Um, He's aware that as much as he wants that statement to be true, it's not exactly true. He says, well, maybe in, you know, Paul, and he thinks, he says Paul uses it three times. He actually only uses it twice. And this is one of them. You know, this is Paul. We're looking at Ephesians. <laughs> so this is one of them. Paul uses it again in Colossians. And he goes on uh, later to interpret this term as, you know, it's a what it's doing is it's abolishing the man-made rules of the Pharisees. That's what Jesus really did. When it says he, he abolished the law of commandments, you know, found in ordinances, he's talking about the Pharisees and their their human traditions, that's what he's really talking about. Um, now, this argument, uh, first of all, I, I want to I say uh, just plainly, the text doesn't say that. The text doesn't make any reference to the man-made dogmas you know, of the Pharisees, so to speak. It, it That's not ever explicitly said. So that's something that he's 
inserting into the text. It's it's again, it's a filter he's putting over it to to say this is what's really going on. Um, but there are big, big, big problems with this argument that oh, because it's the word dogma, and that's about human tradition. That's a pro. That's a big, you know, uh, mark for our position as, as Torah observant. What it really demonstrates this argument is is the willingness that those in the Torah observance movements have to be inconsistent, to just be inconsistent with their own arguments. We'll talk about one thing over here, and that actually refutes what we say over here. But you know, we don't we don't sing them at the same time, so it's fine. Um, we're looking at the Greek, and that's always about human laws, and that's okay over here. But we're going to see that that's a big, big problem. Um, and I'm going to show this in in three ways. Number one, the term dogma most certainly does refer to commandments of God found in the Torah. I'll show you that uh, in Paul. In fact, in that other usage of Paul, uh, that he even acknowledged, oh, you know, maybe Paul uses it that way. Yeah, he does. Um, the second way is we're going to show that inconsistency, how it fatally, I mean, fatally undermines the universal Torah observance interpretation of Acts 15, the one that Caleb holds to, that Rob holds to, that every single Torah observant person I've ever uh, heard from when they talk about Acts 15. The argument they make for for how the Torah observance can be maintained through that passage, um, the argument he just made about dogma is it totally destroys that argument. Uh, so we'll see that. And then um, thirdly, it just ignores the actual definition of the term. He said we need to look at the Greek, but he's not look what he's looking at. And this is an important distinction. He's looking at usage, not definition. Usage, you know, how is this term used? And that's, and it's not that those aren't both important things. It's important to understand both things. You know, what is the definition of the term, but also how is it used? And he's right that many, many times when the term dogma is used, it is referring to human, you know, human decrees. That the the word that you usually off usually see is like decree, as in a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to. You know, take a census of the entire world. Um, that's that's dogma. That's that's the word that's that's in that text. So, yes, it is often, quite often in usage, uh, from a, a human being. But that's not the definition of the term. So we'll get to that. So let's look at that first one. So it most certain it most certainly does refer to commandments of God. Uh, the place that it's used in Paul. Um, the other place in Paul that it is found is in Colossians. Let me pull it up here. Colossians 2.14. This is the one that, um, where it clearly is not a, a doctrine of men or something. Um, it says, Colossians 2.14, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees, that's our term dogma, um, dogma sin, I think, I don't remember which form it is, but that's the term there. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has also taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The decrees against us are the judgments against us for being guilty of of disobeying God, Right? Um, that's what that's what's in in view here, and and the the claim I've heard I heard um, one nineteen ministries in their book tried to claim that this was not about the the laws themselves but just the the punishments or the the penalties of the law, but the penalties of the law are in the law they're part of the Torah so there's no escape there there's no question at all that in this text when it says dogma it's talking about God's you know what God says about us, and and they would say they said penalties, which I think is actually not right either. I don't think he's talking about the penalties against us. That would be the the sentencing, so to speak. I think this is about the verdict. It's the verdict of guilty. It's it's looking at the law and saying, look, you are guilty. You you don't keep the law. You have disobeyed the law. That's the decree against us. You are guilty. Um, and that most certainly is related to the law. It's not related to any man made commandments 
And, and I know that's why Caleb kind of walked back his statement there, you know, but the fact is, if, if that's the case, that's a big, big problem when you're trying to get out from under what it says in Ephesians 2, because we're talking about Paul in both cases. We're talking about the same author. Sure, in, in Acts and Luke, you have the author Luke using that term a lot of, of you know, of uh, humans saying the, the, that word or, or issuing decrees and things like that. But when we look at Paul, Paul's usage, the one time we know for sure is here in Colossians, and it's not about commandments of men. And then, so when you go back over to Ephesians, again, the text never explicitly says it's about doctrines of men or what the Pharisees said. So their, their argument is, again, it's, it's reading something into the text. It's not in the text. It's imposing an idea into the text. Um, the only usage we have from Paul that we can definitively say, it, let me put it this way. Is it possible that Ephesians 2 is talking about, you know, doctrines of men? I mean, theoretically, it's not that it explicitly says, you know, I'm talking about the Torah and not these, you know, it's the point is it's 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 not saying, you know, it can be interpreted that way, and it doesn't immediately and obviously contradict the the context of Ephesians 2. But when we look at Paul and we see the only other time he uses the term, it's about actually about our guilt before God. Then when we look at Ephesians, we, we just run out of any reasons to think that it means doctrines of men, except our, if our own theology demands that we interpret it that way. And I'm sorry, that's doing Bible study backwards. That's doing, uh, that's doing theology study and then imposing our theology on the Bible. Don't do that. So that's problem number one. Problem number one, the it, dogma most certainly does sometimes mean something from God, and the one time we can be totally sure about it, it is also from Paul, just like Ephesians. So it that's a big problem. Problem number two, it does fatal damage to how Torah observers like Rob and Caleb uh, interpret Acts 15. Why is that? It's because of what we see in Acts 16. In Acts 16, 4, we have this word dogma. And this is what it says. It says, now, now remember, this is right after the council. Council happens in Acts 15. This is the very next chapter, Acts 16, 4. It says, now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees, there's your term dogma, which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to keep. What is that talking about? It's talking about the letter, the, the letter with the decrees from the council to the people. And you know what? It's from men. It's from the men at the council. It says so right there, the apostles and elders. It Does it say it was from God? No. But um, that's, a, that's a problem because the Torah observance position is that the decree of the council was that these are the important bits of the Torah, even though some of the half of it isn't from the Torah, but these are the bits that you need to do now, and then you'll learn the Torah as you go, you know, as it's as it's taught. Um, but if these decrees are not, if the, it's dogma, that means it's from men, right? How can how can doctrines of men be your starting place for keeping the Torah? How does that work? Why, why does the Torah need doctrines of men to support it in order to get going? It just doesn't work. Um, this is fatal to the position that, that the council's decision and the letter was giving the Gentiles a starting place for Torah observance. Because if dogma means commands of men, then you're saying that commands and traditions of men are the starting place for keeping the Torah. And I know you don't believe that. I know nobody who, who believes in Torah observance thinks that. But if you think dogma has to mean commands of men, then you think that what the Jerusalem Council gave is commands of men. And I know for sure that Caleb does not think that. I know that for sure. He thinks it came from God. If it came from God, then here's another example, yet another one of dogma 
coming from God. So now we have an example from Luke in the book of Acts, an example from Paul, who also wrote Ephesians, where it definitely refers to uh, commandments of God. So I'm sorry, but looking at the Greek is not getting you out of this one. Um, that's and, and when you do, when you try to do it that way, you're making yourself, you're, you're contradicting what you say about Acts 15 and, and the Jerusalem Council. And then, of course, the, the, finally, the, the argument, it ignores the definition of the word. It ignores, uh, it, it looks at some of the usage, but then it ignores how it, it act, what it actually means. So here we have, I'm going to bring it up, and I'm going to go ahead and just bring up the root. Here's the term dogma, right? This is, and, and you can see in the usages over here a, a, how it's used. A decree went out, you know, from Caesar Augustus, uh, Acts 16, this is the one we just looked at. They were delivering the decrees that had been decided at the council, uh, the dogma. And um, then we have the decrees of Caesar. Um, then we have Ephesians, you know, commandments contained in ordinances. That's dogma. And then Colossians 2.14, consisting of decrees. We, we looked at that too. So here's, here's the examples. You know, we have five occurrences of this term in the New Testament. We've determined two of them for sure. Well, at least if you're Torah observant, two of them have to be from God. Um, but uh, and you know, and but that third one just can't. But here's here's what I want to point out. I just want to point out how is this? What is the actual like lexical definition? Thayer's here at, at you know Bible Hub, and it says public decrees. And there's some examples given. There's even some from outside the Bible of rules and requirements in the law of Moses and and. You know, we see some extra biblical stuff there too. Um, and then certain decrees uh, from the apostles, that's our Acts 15. You know, lots of different examples. But part of, you know, so we see this term a lot, decree. Now, a decree, when we think of how that term is used, the English term, it's a little different from commandment. It's not like you shall always, you know, it's it's not like a standing order typically. Typically, a decree is like what we see there in uh, in Luke two, the a decree went out to take a census. It's more of like, hey, I have a thing you need to do now. It's it's a commandment you're being given now to do once, and then you're done doing it. It's not like a standing order. It's not like the commandments. It's more of a temporary thing. Um, and that's and that you that really fits like all the definition or all the usages we see that it's sort of a hey here's the situation and here's what you should do um, that's what we have in Acts 15 a decree to take a census we have the decrees of Caesar and sort of generally um, the the certificate of debt of decrees against us that's the guilty verdict right it's not a the guilty verdict isn't a standing commandment. It's it's a it's saying, "Hey, you broke the commandments. You're guilty." It's a declaration of something. That's really what the term means. It's a declaration. It's a it's a which may be, you know, varying in terms of length and scope and all those things. But that's really what the word means. And what it's not about whether it comes. It's not. It's clear when we look at the New Testament usage of this term, it's not about whether this came from man or came from God. That's not what, that's not the point of the term. The point of the term is, is it's a declaration of something, you know, that it's like, here, this is something you're being told now, you know, and that fits all of the situations, whether it's from God or from man, right? That's the definition. So you're, you're, you're missing the definition of the word in order to try to, you know, fixate on some of the usage of the word and try to impose that usage in Act, in Ephesians two. Again, it just doesn't work. That's that's not um, that's not doing good Bible study. That is imposing your theological conclusions onto a text that is looks to be against your theological conclusions, um, and that's that's a big. Big problem. Let's keep going and look at the next section here. Uh, to, to say that this is somehow abolishing the need for Gentiles to keep the law is, I think, probably... I just don't understand how anybody can believe that. Th this is Unless human. you're already <clears throat> biased towards that. 
how conveniently you have set aside the commands of God by your tradition. Again, I have uh, I've addressed this. This is simple ad hominem. This is not dealing with the arguments. This is this is shameful behavior. Is what this is. Oh, you've got to be biased against it. That's the only way you could possibly come to a different conclusion. And he's like, how conveniently you set aside the law of God. And I say, how conveniently you set aside the scriptures in order to hang on to your Torah observance theology. How conveniently you find so much bias in your theological opponents so that you don't actually ever have to deal with their arguments with any seriousness. It, it was many, many months ago that I put up a thorough refutation of Tim Hegg's Hebrews commentary when it came to Hebrews chapter 8. I was doing my Hebrews series. I got to Hebrews 8, and um, Caleb had been so kind as to send me a copy, a digital copy of Tim Hegg's commentary, and I read it, and I noted all the major, major problems with how Tim Hegg ignores things, reads his own theology into the text, all, all these same things that we're saying uh, when it came to Hebrews chapter 8 and, and the New Covenant. And, uh, you know, that's been up for many months, and I haven't seen these guys in this show or any other place make any mention of it. Um, nothing that I said in there was me just being biased and just, oh, that can't be true, silly Torah observance. You know, no, it was seriously looking at the text and showing how Tim Haig was not being consistent and not being faithful to the text. Have they said anything about it? No. And then um, a, a little while later, I did another live stream and was talking about this show, <laughs> about the Messiah Matters show, talking about their argument regarding the term olam and if it means forever and how does that work. And um, and how poorly they dealt with that issue. Have they tried to deal with that in any in any serious way? No, of course not. Because that's see, they they would rather talk about these comments that are very surface level um, and don't really get down to the details. And and that's that's shameful. That's not what they should be doing. You know, as as your brother in Christ, guys, I'm I'm telling you, this is not how you ought to be behaving when it comes to theological dispute. You know, it's it's not that you don't deal with the silliness too. <laughs> I'm not telling you only deal with the most serious stuff out there. I'm just telling you, if you want, if you present yourselves as you do, as defenders of the faith, as defenders of your theological convictions, then defend them. Your, your viewers know, because I know a lot of your viewers are also my viewers, and that's part of the reason you get some of the questions you get. And that defend your view against the, the case that, that is being made against it from the text and show us that actually I'm the one mishandling the text. Show us that from the text. Don't just say, oh, yeah, bias. I just can't believe these people believe that. No, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're ignoring the actual argument and you're slandering your opponent, falsely accusing them of wrongdoing, falsely accusing us, people like me, of, have, of making these arguments because of simple bias. We, oh, we just don't want to, we just don't want to keep the law. No, it's not it at all. Um, I very much want to obey God, very, very much. And I'm, you know, I fail at it too. But I, if, if God could, if God told me in the Bible that I need to do what you guys say I need to do, I'll be doing it. But it's, but as we're seeing, your arguments aren't coming from the Bible. They're coming from somewhere else. I don't know. I, what I definitely see happening is that you're putting your theology on top of the text. That's definitely happening. All right. Let's keep going. 
Okay, so let's be a little bit fair here to the people who are who are uh, pushing this. This has been a part of Christian dogma. Dogma. That, I'm gonna use it that's again. That's fair. Since the uh, since the early what since 200, right? And so the the point here is simply this. Um, it, while I understand, while I understand where this is coming from, God is doing a work. We're seeing it in churches. We're seeing people coming to the truth that the Torah is cannot be done away with, and that God's laws are not burdensome, as the Scripture specifically says. First John specifically says, right? But rather that that we should love and keep the commandments, and that we come closer to God when we do. All right. Now, I know that Caleb affirms sola fide. I know he affirms that, and so I'm going to try to assume that um, when he said what he what you just heard, that by we come closer to God by by keeping the commandments, um, that he means something like you know obedience correlates with a better closer walk with God. It's it's a it's a kind of an experiential thing. Um, but what's what's really funny here, and and he's not he again. It's 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 whether you're thinking through your theology properly. He just got through in this episode right before this comment with criticizing the Messianic Jewish movement for having a special set of rules for Jews that make them special. So Messianic Jews often say the these ceremonial aspects of the law they're for Jews. And only Jews need to do them. Here's the thing, the problem though. When you when if you believe in keeping Torah the way that that he does, and you believe, as he just said, a person will be closer to God by doing that, what you're doing is you are implicitly saying that those who keep the Torah the way that Caleb does are closer to God, they're special. And those who don't aren't as special. They're not as close to God. They're doing the very thing that they were the, criticizing the Messianic Jews of doing by having a special set of rules for them. It's not, you know, Rob and Caleb don't think the rules are specially for them, but they think that those who do keep them are special, are closer to God than those who don't. You know, it comes back around to circumcision again. You know, it... It's not a, you know, the, they're saying, you know, the Jews back then, they had this special right of the proselyte that they got circumcised and became Jewish, and that's how they, you know, became members of the covenant, and so it was this special thing. And they say, no, that's not right. We're, we're, we're saved by faith. Circumcision comes later and then makes you that special. Hey, you know, it's, it's uh, they still believe that Torah observance people are above the, the rest of us. And, and, and he just said it there by saying that they, you draw closer to God by doing these things, like by keeping Sabbath and, and circumcision and all that stuff. The reason I don't think that they're not you know, condemned and, and, and false teachers and all that is because they do affirm, and affirm quite strongly, that salvation is, is by grace through faith. It isn't, you know, doing these things doesn't make you any more right with God, but somehow it makes you closer to God. Um, I agree that obedience is better than disobedience, and 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 so it, I don't disagree that that you know we should be obeying God, but but realize that you're not you're not the things you criticize the messianics for is it, you're not far off from them. Uh, you're just not saying it out loud the way they do. Um, and, and it's not about ethnicity for you, but it is about joining up with your, your theological group, um, that those are the people who really want to follow God. The rest of us are just biased. All right, let's go to the next section here. It says in Ephesians 2.15 abolishes, if, if Ephesians 2.15 abolishes the Torah, then it directly contradicts Matthew 5.17. And a slew, and I do mean slew of other passages, including Paul himself, in th places like Romans what Romans three thirty one does faith therefore nullify the law? May it never be, right? Um, it, it, and the list could go on, j even just in Romans, right? So coming back, he's, they're still talking about Ephesians two fifteen abolishing the Torah, 
that directly contradicts Matthew 5.17. Well, as you've already heard, there's that's not the only way to understand Matthew 5.17. Um, we, we talked about that. But um, but again, it's it's not you got you got to read the Bible for, for in its context. You know, not all Christians who reject Torah observance think that the whole Torah is abolished. It's it's specific parts are not the same. They've changed, right? And and I do think that in Ephesians it's using that term abolished, but it doesn't and it is about those things, but it's not that oh yeah, the whole thing we can, we can just ignore the law. No, that again, that's not really what we're saying. Pretty much any thoughtful Christian would say that it's only specific commands that have changed, or as Ephesians 2 says, have been abolished in some sense. Um, but again, they would, <laughs> this is where a proper understanding of the term dogma would be really helpful. Dogma means decrees, dogma means, you know, something that isn't necessarily a universal law, but is just, here's what you are commanded to do right now, you know, certain people you know, members of the Roman Empire, go to your hometown to be counted. That's the decree. It's not a a standing law all the time, be in your hometown to be counted. It's a specific command for a specific time. That's That's what dogma means. Gosh, that sounds really a lot like the way we, the way Christians have often talked about these particular parts of the Torah. You know, <laughs> so it, it doesn't contradict Matthew 17. Um, it just doesn't. And and any other text that says something highly about about the law, again, Kay, or Rob gave it to us. He said, "Yeah, law is used in a number of different ways." Yes, it is. So we should look at the ways it's used in all of those contexts, and not just assume that it mean it supports your theology just because you can quote it. Show us from the context how it must support your theology. If you can't do that, then the Bible doesn't support your theology in a way that we must adhere to. It just doesn't. All right, next bit. A couple of weeks ago, our pastor came to me and told me that the church was joining the Assemblies of God. This was disappointing to my wife and I, but in chatting with the pastor, we discussed my issues with uh, A.G., Baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, etc. Uh, Assemblies of God is AG, by the way. For those, <laughs> oh Johnny, I said joke. I got you, Johnny. All right. Um, in our discussion, I used the idea that Acts is dis- uh, descriptive, but not prescriptive. Okay. In doing this, I began to wonder whether the argument for Torah observance could face the same critique. Your thoughts are appreciated. Okay. Before we get to his thoughts. This is important. This is a great question, actually. He's asking, is it, is, is the, you know, Acts is a narrative, right? It's descriptive of things that happened. And it is common among those who are more charismatic and talk about, you know, the continuation of the gifts and things like that, that um, they look at at things that happen in Acts where these gifts are exercised, and they say this is normative for the church, this is what we should do, this is what we're commanded to do, um, and just because people are doing it, and, and this is how things are happening in the church. This is the argument that the commenter is making is that, well, Acts is descriptive, not always prescriptive. Not everything that just happens in Acts is something we should take as, as a command. Basically, that's a commandment for us. Um, and he, he got to thinking, wait a minute, don't we make, don't we do this? So this is getting back to something that was earlier in the episode. Don't we do this with things like Acts 16 and Acts 21, you know, um, he doesn't get into all the specifics, but he says, couldn't the same thing be said about the Torah observance argument? That's the question. The Torah observance argument makes a lot of arguments from Acts. Couldn't. Couldn't the same thing be said? Well, that's descriptive. That's not prescriptive. There's not a commandment in there for us that we have to do it that way just because they did it that way. Um, can't that be said of us, what what I would say about the, the charismatic folks? Um, and I would say that, yes, exactly. When, um, 
when the Torah observance folks are appealing to places like Acts 16 about circum- circumcising Timothy, Acts 21, uh, as they did in the show, that is exactly what they're doing. They're taking a description of something happening and they're trying to make it prescriptive on, on all Christians. Um, and, and Caleb's answer doesn't really answer the question. I'm not going to get into it, but he spends a lot of time talking about the Holy Spirit and because because he's talking about you know assemblies of God and and all of that, uh, but he really doesn't address that descriptive prescriptive part of the question. But he does come back around to it a little bit later, a few minutes later. So let's go ahead and listen to that. This is what our brother is talking about in terms of descriptive instead of prescriptive. Then yes, I would agree with you. However, what I would say is that throughout the uh, the book of Acts, we have a, a significant amount of of uh, commands that are given, and I think that they are of the Holy Spirit, right? The, the notion of things like Acts 15, that we don't force the Gentiles to learn all the Torah before that they can convert, no, we, we give them the things needed to be able to be in a believing community, and then they will learn the rest of the Torah, for Moses has preached every Shabbat, right? So, uh, I think that, that is. I think that that's of the Lord. I don't think that that's pr- descriptive and not prescriptive. Um, however, I understand what you're saying. I would say that the Book of Acts is not a place, a great place to go if you want to talk about doing away with Torah. Acts 21 is a perfect example of this. Okay, so two problems. Of course, he's he at the end there. He's kind of missing the question entirely when he's talking. To, He showed kind of in the middle that he understands the question. He says, you're right. I don't think that Acts is a great place to go to, um, or actually, no, that's what he he messed up at the end. He says that, you know, descriptive and prescriptive, I think he was understanding properly that, you know, we don't don't take mere descriptions as as prescriptive on their face. You know, there's got to be good reason for it. But really, you know, at the end there, he's he, he's he's saying that as if people who uh, disagree with him are the ones uh, going to acts to say, you know, that it's you know that that we're taking descriptions and making them prescriptive. But we're not. What when we're going to acts and we're talking about Acts fifteen and when we talk about Acts sixteen and that it was and that Timothy's circumcision was because of the Jews. We're pointing out that in the narrative, the things that would need to be true if Torah observance were true are not happening. We're pointing out that these people are acting in discord with Torah observance theology. So it's not that the description of the events is something we're trying, we're saying we must emulate exactly what's going on in Acts. We're saying, Look at how these people in Acts are not acting like Torah observant people today. <laughs> you know, the people today that say, you must be circumcised. And they're just like, wow, they're, they're not saying that. Um, so that's a, that, uh, Caleb is, is, is missing the point when he says, oh, you shouldn't go to Acts to try to deny Torah observance. I mean, look at Acts 21. Acts 21 is a description of Paul paying some people's fees And it's a description of Paul being charged by some people with twisting the Torah all the way around so that what used to be required is now forbidden. That's what Paul's actually being accused of. That's not modern Christian theology. Um, What Paul is being accused of is not what we believe. It's not what Paul believed either. Um, Paul didn't say you shall not circumcise if you're a Jew. He just, but he, he does say in Galatians, if you're, if you're not circumcised, don't, don't get circumcised. Uh, and he never says, except until later. You know, he, he doesn't do that. So, yeah, the, the question, he's, he's missing the question entirely. The question from the, the, the commenter is, aren't, aren't, isn't the Torah observance argument guilty? of making descriptions and acts prescriptive? And the answer is absolutely yes, they are. Um, and he, he just kind of misses that question entirely. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate. So that, that person who asked the question, they didn't get an answer. Um, 
But the second problem is, is even bigger. And this is, if you're, if you're, if you're remembering a little earlier in this video, you're remembering what I'm talking about, is that Paul or is that Caleb says that the that what was found in the Jerusalem Council's letter is of the Holy Spirit. It's from the Lord. It's it's the starting place for people to begin to keep Torah, and that's from the Lord. That's commands from the Lord. Caleb. Acts 16 says their dogma. That's what Acts 16 says about those commands. So either your argument from the word dogma about Ephesians 2 is bunk, or what you're saying there is bunk about Acts 15. Which one is it? Which one are you going to give up because you can't keep both of them if you want to be consistent? You can't say that dogma just means commandments of men except everywhere that it doesn't, you know. It, it, it means commandments of men in Ephesians. It has to. It just has to. Um, no, you, you've got no argument from the word dogma in, in Ephesians 2 if these are really commands from the Lord. But if, if, they are, if they aren't commandments of the Lord, but rather wise counsel for the situation from the men at the council, as it actually says in Acts 16, when it describes them as being from the apostles and elders. Notice it doesn't say from the Lord. Um, and it does say it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us in the letter. So they do reference the Holy Spirit, but they say it seemed good to tell you these things. And you know what? I believe that was from the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't a commandment to be kept forever and ever. It was a set of instructions for the specific to them in that time in that place it was a decree the word dogma is a perfect word for that understood in its own actual definition not the um you know saying it just applies to men no i think it was from the lord i think you're right about that but i don't think that it was from the lord in the sense that thou shalt not murder is from the lord uh, it's not the same kind of instruction but, uh, but yeah, so that's a big problem. Um, you, you've got a major, major inconsistency there. Uh, you're going to have to give up one of those two positions, um, I'm afraid. All right, we're getting close to the end, folks. Just a, a few more clips. All right, this is where, um, ah, this is important stuff. I told you, this episode has a lot of nuggets. It has a lot of good just things that are said often in Torah observant like circles that that it's good to have a, a response to. So, you know, I I know it's a little bit seems a little disjointed and it's kind of going all over the place, and that's fine. I mean, that's their sh it's their show. <laughs> um, I don't criticize them one bit for it. I mean, they're just they're dealing with the topics as they come up, and that's great. And th but they say so many things that I think are just so commonly said that. That deserve response, and so, and this is another one, um, and uh, and how they see people who are not keeping Torah, depending on the situation. And I and and I have a very very important question for them uh, regarding this. What what Caleb says here: person is shown the truth and believes the truth that they should be keeping the Sabbath and the kosher laws and the festivals and circumcision these things and they say you know what I know that I should be doing it I know the scripture teaches it but puh, I'm not going to do that that's a high hand that's that that is not a heart for God that is a different heart based on just the words he said I kind of think I already know the answer to this question it's not that big a deal but I I just feel like I need to ask um the question is what about you know, I get there's people who just don't know, and they talk about this a lot. There's, there's a lot of Christians who just have no idea about all this stuff. And we don't think that they're, like, bad, and, and, and that's what this is about. Like, they're, they're not, you know, guilty of this high-handed sin. But the people who do know, they are. And that's, and that's what he's saying. Now, literally, to, to literally take what he said at face value, the question I would have is, am I guilty of this high-handed sin? Does Caleb think I'm guilty of that high-handed sin of not keeping the Torah, even though I know I, I'm supposed to? 
Now, taking him at face value in his words, the answer would be no. Because it says, if you know you're supposed to do these things and believe you're supposed to do these things, but you say, no, I don't want to do these things. Well, I don't know or believe that I'm supposed to do these things. But I'm also not, you know, again, this is where it is incomplete. They're, they're talking about different categories and they're not talking about the, what about the important one? You know, the people who have no idea about this Torah observance stuff, they've got those people in one category. They've got the people who know about it and believe it's true and yet don't want to do it. I don't know who those people are, honestly. I mean, literally the way he says it, who exists, who believes they're supposed to do it and doesn't do it. Um, like, and doesn't do it with a high hand, like do, just says, nah, I, 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 I don't want to do the Torah. I know I'm supposed to, but I refuse. Like that, what kind of person is that? I don't even, I've never met a person like that. I've met people who reject God and I've met people who are trying to follow God and they sin and they still sin. They still fall short, but they don't think they're not like People who are disregarding the commandments of God are typically those, they're also saying they don't believe. I don't know. I don't know who those people are. But you, I know those two categories doesn't include me. I'm not that. I'm not in either one of those categories. I'm a person who has deeply studied Caleb's position on the Torah and deeply studied the law and the covenants and the scriptures and how this stuff goes together. And my conclusion is, no, we don't have to keep the commandments the way that ancient Israel kept the commandments. Um, some of the commandment now, some of the commandments we do, some of the commandments are universal. They apply to everybody. They always have, they always will. But some of the commandments are specific. They're covenant-related. They're tied to a specific covenant, and that covenant is no longer in effect. We're in a new covenant. This covenant also has laws that are specific to it, that are in, are in effect, but only for people in the covenant. I believe in covenant regulations. I believe baptism and the Lord's Supper are covenant regulations. I believe um, that having a church run by elders and fulfilling the Great Commission are covenant regulations. That's what I believe. I believe, and, and, by, and in saying that, I specifically mean People in the covenant, that is, believers in Christ, are obligated to do those things. You know, um, I don't believe that the pagan unbeliever is obligated to do those things. Now, those the pagan unbeliever is obligated to obey God in all the other moral laws, and that person is also obligated to repent and believe in Christ. And should that person do so, that person will then become a member of the new covenant, and become obligated to do all the covenant regulations. That is the new covenant regulations, not the Sinai covenant regulations. The Sinai covenant regulations are fulfilled in the new covenant. They were prophetic. That's, that's how fulfilled works. <laughs> is they, they were something that we still have, but in a in new form today in, in the new covenant that that they didn't have under the Sinai covenant. So I have a I have a place for all of these things in my theology. Am I guilty of, of a high-handed sin and not having a heart for God because I disagree with your Torah observance theology? What do you think? Now, if I, I honestly don't know the answer to this question. I'm not asking a rhetorical gotcha kind of question. I'm asking a question. I'm saying, look, Caleb, you've talked about Two categories of person. What about category three, the one that I'm in? Am I guilty of the high-handed sin? Because it's not that I'm ignorant of the Torah. I'm, I'm not. But I'm also not ignorant of the covenants and how things have changed. Um, and, I, and I don't think, to, to be clear with you, I don't think you're guilty of high-handed sin for wanting to keep the Torah. I don't think that's, I think you're wrong. That that it's uh, that it's mandatory, and I don't think mandatory means burdensome either. Um, but I I don't I think that a high handed sin. Now I th I think that the unbeliever is guilty of high handed sin by being an unbeliever, because he's without excuse. That's what Romans one says. Um, and I believe that a person who claims to be a believer, but does as you're talking about and does totally disregard 
all the commandments of God is is a adulterer and a drunkard and, and those kinds of things. And is and and despite and it's not that he, that person may say he believe he doesn't believe those things apply. Nah, God's not real. You know that person may say he's not obligated to do those things, but he's still guilty of high handed sin because deep down he knows that he is guilty of those things. I I think there is such a thing as high handed sin, and that it's a, it's it's evidence of of unbelief. Um, so even if if a person professes to believe. They say I'm a Christian, but they don't. They don't live in a way that's consistent with being a Christian. <laughs> then there's evidence of, of high-handed sin there, um, regardless of what they say. They, you know, it, it's just it's it comes out in what they do. But my problem with Torah observance theology is that it creates this other category of commandments <clears throat> that many of the the greatest of the church fathers and, and, and Christians down through the ages have not have believed do not apply to them the way they applied to ancient Israel. Are they all guilty of high-handed sin? I don't think so. Um, even the ones who, who deeply, deeply study the scriptures. All right, let's keep going here. What I would say is that the Christian, the mainstream Christian church, you have ton, you have hundreds of thousands of Bible-believing Christians who love God with all their heart, but they have been taught something different. They have been given a, they have been fed something that is not right. And what they've been fed is, this is how we don't have to keep these laws anymore. This is, and you know what, here's all the theology to go around it. They've built this house of cards, and now these new believers are coming in, or these people who are raised in the church have accepted what their teachers have taught them. Guess what? It doesn't take too much Bible knowledge for that car, for that deck of cards to, to fall under. It just doesn't. And the fact is, is that this is why we're seeing what I am considering another reformation in the church. You have thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to the belief that we should be keeping the Sabbath, that we should be keeping the festivals, that we should be keeping a kosher diet. And guess what? So much so that mainstream ministries like Piper, like MacArthur, like others, they are having to actually now pivot and and put out videos and teachings on, oh, well, this is why the, the, the scriptures say we don't have to keep these, these commands anymore. Guess what? It doesn't take much to respond to these people. All we have to do is read the text. But in the Messianic Jewish... So, Caleb's made this argument many times. Um, you know, he said, oh, we've been fed that we don't have to keep the Torah. And that's all that's really going on. And it's just a, a house of cards. The tiniest little bi bit of Bible knowledge just topples it. And, you know, he, he sees the growth of Torah, Torah observance as a, a, another reformation and and you know all these mainstream teachers are having to address it. The thing is, I can employ his argumentation to answer why it's quote unquote easy to respond to these big teachers when they address Torah observance. You know, they they'll address you know something like Piper or MacArthur or some who says something about Torah observance, and it's because they've never really had to deal with it before, right? They haven't really studied the those arguments that guys like these are making, and so. You know when they're they're kind of shooting from the hip, and because they're shooting from the hip, you know it's it's not hard to maybe find some holes in in their arguments. So Caleb's own reasoning is actually giving us the reason why they are able uh, to to respond to the people that they do respond to, uh, because those guys just haven't dealt with their arguments before. This is a new phenomenon. It's it's not something that that they've read about when they were going to seminary. It's it, like they may have read about, you know, the, the Reformation, Roman Catholicism, and how, what happened there. And, you know, they may have read about, oh, there's other, these other cults and religions and things out there, and they've read about that. And, but this, was, this is a, a different movement that they haven't read about, so they're having to kind of shoot from the hip. And therefore, yeah, it's, it's, it's not always really perfect. You know how they respond, and so so Caleb thinks, oh, this is a new reformation, you know, because look at all these big name people who can't can't answer us. Um, but he's not calculating for people who really do understand Torah observance and are responding to it biblically. Caleb's entire presentation pretends that people like that don't exist, right? He he's not he's not addressing anybody 
that really understands where he's coming from. And, you know, the fact is, you know, what he sees as a this big movement of the spirit, this big new reformation, I mean, all I see it is is as is a growth of a false set of a false system of belief among people who don't really know their Bibles. That's what I see. And the better they know their Bibles and the better they understand the Christian relationship to the both the Old and New Testament and the, the relationship of the covenants, all this stuff pretty much sorts itself out and it doesn't work. It doesn't the, the Torah observance position just doesn't work at that point. Um I think that in the future, and I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime or if it'll be beyond it, but I think that this this movement is going to go the same way that a lot of, of these uh, other movements have gone, where it continues to have a place in society the way that you know Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses continue to have a place in society, where uneducated Christians continue to be swindled by it, but um, Christianity as a whole... Uh, is pretty much aware of it and just and and knows you know basically how to respond and and it's not no longer this this big movement or this big growing thing um, is it growing now I think so but that's because it's new and and it hasn't really been dealt with uh, the way that uh, you know it it just hasn't been studied or, or known uh, the way that uh, that it will be in the future. Uh, I think it is being now. I think there are people now who are doing it. We just aren't very uh, very uh, well-known or influential just yet. I want to finish up by actually going back to an earlier point in their show where, um, because something they said, just I thought this was just worth saying <laughs> here at the end. Um, and And so I want to play this clip and then uh, respond to this, and and it's kind of where we'll where we'll leave it off, and uh, and so let's do that. Exactly, Caleb. And I wonder, like, is there a set of questions that a, a Christian could ask themselves to like check their bias? Like, a, do people have bias? Okay, yeah, sure. We is it do. possible that part of my baggage that I'm bringing to the Bible is a bias against what the Word of God is actually saying? And if so, watch out. <laughs> how how can I inspect that? And and the way Yeshua put it is, do I have a log in my eye? <laughs> Am I walking around judging other people for specks in their eye when I have a huge log in my own eye? And I would suggest that that's fair to to ask a, a Christian brother or sister who says the, the law is done away or or everything but the Ten Commandments is done away. To say, is it possible? Are you willing to even consider that you might have a blind spot here? And if someone says, no, I don't have a blind spot, it's like, well, okay, I, I don't know how profitable it would be to continue that conversation. So I agree with Rob 100%. I agree with him 100%. Absolutely, we should always ask ourselves and ask anybody, you know, and maybe we can, it's, it may be profitable, it may not be, <laughs> to to ask another person, hey, do you think you're bringing bias? I mean, again, bias is, is it's kind of like motive. It's kind of like, of course we all bring bias to the table. Of course we all have motives. There, But that's not something, you know, the, we really can control. What we can control is how are we responding to the truth? Caleb grew up in the Torah movements. He grew up Torah observant. Think about that. Um, Rob came in as a young adult, like many in the in the Torah movements. Um, it's impossible for anyone to come to the scriptures completely without baggage. I talk about that's what we should be doing because that's what we should be striving to do. But we're all human. We all have biases and, and baggage and things that we we have to do our best to try to work around. So we're working around that and not working around the text and trying to get the text to fit our biases. So yeah, we should definitely 
realize that we 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 all come to it with baggage. And, and the problem is, Rob and Caleb, they offer no acknowledgement that they might be doing that. They might just be doing that. Um, it's always assumed it's their opponents that are doing that. Um, and they even said, I mean, you heard Caleb say there briefly, yeah, we're all baggage. But when it comes to these particular issues, who's got the baggage? Well, again, I think we all can come to it with baggage. But let's try to just set that aside for a minute and look at the text. Let's set that aside and do our best to really understand what God said. And then take a look and see if it's if we're if we're still in the right place or if we need to change. Really what this comes down to is it is more ad hominem. It's more attacking their opponents for their motives, for their bias, for their baggage now. Um, and they're ignoring any serious challenges to their position while they're doing that. Talking about bias, yeah, we've all got it. And and we can see it in when somebody is willing to totally ignore serious questions about what they're what they say and they by trying to change the terminology or trying to change what we're actually talking about. Oh, it's not is it mandatory? Well, it's not burdensome. Well, I know you're shifting the goalposts. That wasn't the question. Um, is is acts descriptive or prescriptive? Well, those uh, anti Torah people shouldn't shouldn't take it as prescriptive. Well, that wasn't the question, was it? You know, um, let's let's not try to shift the goalposts. Let's not try to pretend that a YouTube comment is the answer or is the is the final best argument that anyone on the opposing side could come up with. Oh, this is their last ditch effort because nothing else worked. No, that's that's just not true. Show me where you've answered all the other really strong stuff. You haven't done it. You haven't done your homework on that. Like I said at the start, I, I believe Rob and Caleb are brothers in Christ. Uh, I don't know Rob. I've never talked to him. Um, but I, I believe Caleb is a, a friend. Um, maybe not after this, maybe this this strong of a public um, challenge to his very public show. Uh, is, I don't know if that's something that, that he can tolerate, but I don't know. But I, I will make this, try to make this as clear as I can. Yes, this is a challenge. This is a challenge to anybody uh, in, uh, you know, to, to do your due diligence. But this is a specific challenge to Rob and Caleb. Specifically, guys, do your due diligence. Don't pretend you're out there defending Torah observance when this is the best you're responding to. I've got so much content. And I, you know, I'm you'll notice I'm not here challenging you to a debate. I, I know you don't really like debating, um, and that's fine. Um, but I am challenging you to not just pick the easiest stuff to respond to. Like, don't do that. If someone has presented something where they think, look, this is, this is an answer, a deep answer to, to what you say, respond to it properly. And I know maybe that's, maybe that's not the kind of thing appropriate for for your show for for this particular show this particular show is you know it's it's kind of fast paced and topical and about you know only one or two th things per show it's not really about digging really really deep into into these things the way you do in, in maybe other places fine do it in those other places show me where you have answered the things that i've said or that rob solberg has said not and not the shorts the the long form really in-depth presentations he's given show us and you know until you've done that then i feel like you're you're opening yourself up to the exact same accusations you're slinging at the other side oh, well they're just biased you know they grew up that way or they they've been convinced of of that position uh without really having anyone challenge it cuz most uh most you know big Theologians and apologists today 
aren't really aware of <laughs> the arguments that are, are at play. And so nobody's really given any, you know, who's got a, a big audience has really given a, a solid response. Um, but the solid responses do exist and you know right where to find them. So I will leave it at that. I hope that they will do something with it. So far, they're, they haven't really wanted to actually engage those things. They, they're doing what they're doing. But yes, I, I am challenging them to actually do something substantive. Uh, you say you're defending Torah observance, defend it. Defend it. I've got so much content out there that it refutes it. Show me why I'm wrong. Okay? And you don't even have to credit me. Just say, hey, there's this argument out there. And then, like, represent it accurately. And then show from the text of Scripture why it's wrong. What do you think? All right. Thank you so much for watching. Appreciate you.